Hello, good morning. This is Rick Pina, and I'm bringing you today's word for March 9th, 2022. I'm teaching a series all year entitled Intentional Progress, where this is a year progression for us, but we're going to pursue that progress on purpose. We will be deliberate about becoming the men, the women that God has called us to be for such a time as this. We want to maximize this season. We want to maximize the now while we're getting ready for the next. I'm telling you, this is going to be great. The best is yet to come. Greater is coming for you. We've been learning life lessons from the life of Jesus. As I get ready to teach now, I want you to open up your heart to receive. All right, so let's get into the word for this morning. I'm excited about it. I trust that you are as well. Like I said yesterday, I felt like I was in teaching mode. And as a preacher, you know, even though I can't see you, right, it's weird because even though I can't see you watching me, like, you know, if we were in the same room and, and, and I'm preaching and I could look out and see your faces, it'll be different. But even though I couldn't see you, I just sensed that you were locked in. And uh, and I, I just believe that you're going to be locked in again today. I, we're going to get into this passage just so good. We've already studied as we're, we're seeking to, you know, glean some things for, for 2022. And I'm going to teach you through all six of these steps. I'm still on the first one. Um, as we were looking at uh, different things from the life of Jesus, and we we looked at John 5, 6, 8, 12, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and now we're in chapter 19. Um, as I get into this, let's ju let's just go to the word. I want you to open up your heart to receive. This is Life Lessons from the Life of Jesus, part 41 and the road to the resurrection, part 12. I'm going to cover John chapter 19. We had done yesterday verses 8 through 11. Today, normally I would just pick it up at verse 12, but I was led to go back to 10. So this is 10 through 13. I'm going to read verses 10 through 13 to you from the easy to read version, and then the Passion Translation, and then we'll get into it. You ready? This is what the Bible says. John chapter 19, verses 10 through 13. Pilate said, you refuse to speak to me? Really, Jesus? Remember, I'm the one that has the power to set you free, or I'm the one that has the power to have you killed on a cross. <laughs> and Jesus answered, hold on for a minute, homeboy. Uh, the only power you have was given to you by God. So the one who handed me over to you is actually guilty of an even greater sin. Don't even think that you have power over me. It's not even like that. Verse 12, after this, Pilate tried to let Jesus go free. He was like, man, forget it, man. I, this, ain't, this ain't right. Let me let Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders shouted, anyone who makes himself a king against Caesar, huh, watch it, watch it. If you let this, if this man go free, then you're not Caesar's friend and we're going to report you to Caesar. So when Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus over to the place called the stone pavement and he just let it happen. Basically, he was like, nah, I'm not going to get in trouble over this thing. And he let Jesus go. John chapter 19, verses 10 through 13 from the Passion Translation. Perplexed, Pilate said, are you going to play deaf with me? Don't you know that I have the power to, to set you free? And I have the power to nail you to a tree? And Jesus answered, you would have no power over me at all unless it was given to you from above. So don't get it twisted. This is why I said the one that betrayed me is actually uh, uh, guilty of a greater sin. But from then on, this is what the Bible says, Pilate tried to find a situation, a, a tried to find a way out of the situation and set Jesus free. He wanted to set Jesus free. But the Jewish authorities, they shouted at him and they said, listen, if you let this man go free, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who declares himself as a king is an enemy of the emperor. And if you do this, we're going to report you to Caesar. So when Pilate heard this threat, he relented and he said, okay, forget it. I was going to let Jesus go free, but I'm going to let it go. And so he had Jesus, the Bible says, who was already torn and bleeding to be brought outside. And then he went through the process. So what does this mean for you today? This little passage here, I mean, this is, what, this is why I love preaching. I could read one or two verses, you know, a little passage here and there, 
And then God just gives me so much revelation because there's revelation and layers and layers and layers of revelation in God's word. I could come back to this passage again tomorrow and get a whole nother message. And then the next day, and then, and you know, I've done that before. But anyway, let me just share with you what God gave me this morning. I have three things to share with you about this passage. And as I get into these three things, I need you to read your heart and mind of all distractions. Number one, what God has for you is for you. What God has for you is for you. Now, I know that we normally say that what God has for me is for me is even a song. We, we say that, but a lot of times we say that within the context of, you know, what God has for me is for me in a good way. But guess what? Sometimes that applies to you in a not so good way too. In John chapter 19, we see Pilate, he knew that Jesus was innocent. He knew that Jesus had done nothing wrong and he knew that Jesus was sentenced to death and he tried to get him out of it the first time. Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah. I can set one man free. He put him up and the people chose Barabbas. And then he has a conversation with Jesus and he's like, man, I got to let this man go free. And so he tries. He's like, I, I, this man is innocent. I don't want to have innocent blood on my hands. And the Bible says from then on, Pilate tried to find a way out of the situation. He tried to set Jesus free, but then the Jews who were dead set on having Jesus killed, they threatened him. They said, listen, this man has claimed to be a king. Anyone who claims to be a king is against Caesar. And if you if you let this man go free, we're going to report you to the emperor. So what do you, And he was like, well, now, now you're trying to get me in trouble. So when Pilate heard the threat, the Bible says he relented and he let Jesus go throughout the process. Here's the point. When you are supposed to go through a challenge, I, well, God has for me is for me. That's good and also for not so good stuff. Let me explain. When you're supposed to go through something, a challenge, a difficulty, on the road to your destiny, then when even, when, when there are people that are trying to get you out of it, <laughs> and then at the end of the day, you will be forced and basically pushed or propelled to go in through, uh, through the process of enduring that challenge because you're supposed to do it. This is why there's a proverb that says that you can't always just rescue people out of their situation. Because when you just rescue people out of their situations, if you're always there, and especially as a parent, we got to be careful not to do that. If you're always there to, oh, my son, my daughter's in trouble. Let me get them out. My son, my daughter's in trouble. Let me get them out. There's some things that they're supposed to go through. And you, if you keep getting them out, you're not helping them. You're hurting them. Pilate was trying to help them. And then it didn't work out. Why? Because Jesus was supposed to go through it. See, people would try to help you to get out of something. But if you're supposed to go through it, then their plans are going to fail. In the situation, another situation I thought about this morning was the situation with Joseph. The Bible says that when Joseph's brothers decided to kill him, you know, they were holding him for a moment. And Reuben, this is in Genesis chapter 37, the Bible says Reuben planned to save Joseph and to send him back to his father. Reuben planned to save Joseph and to send him back to his father. But guess what? Reuben's plan failed because Joseph needed to go through what he was supposed to go through to become who Joseph was called to be. If you go back, that's Genesis 37. If you back it all the way up to Genesis chapter 15, God was speaking to Abraham. Listen, think about the sovereignty of God for a moment. God was speaking to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. In Genesis chapter 15, God says to Abraham, see all the land that you can see, you can have. I'm giving you this land and it will be your land forever for you and your descendants. But then he said this in Genesis chapter 15. In 37, Genesis 37, Joseph's brothers turned on him. And eventually they, Reuben tried to get him out of it, but Reuben's plan failed. Joseph needed to get out of there. And where did he wind up? He wound up in Egypt. That's Genesis chapter 37. Back it up to Genesis chapter 15. God is speaking to Abraham. Here's the land. It's your land and your descendants' land forever. But he said this, Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 and 14. You should know this, Abraham, your descendants, there's going to come a time where your descendants will live in a country that is not their own. They will be strangers there. And then the people there will make them slaves and will be cruel to them for 400 years. Then I will punish that nation that made them slaves and I will deliver them out. Oh, snap. So God said this in Genesis chapter 15. And in Genesis chapter 37, while Joseph is about to go to Egypt, one of his brothers said, no, no, I need to get him out. I, I, I need to help him. I need to send him back home. But his plan failed. You know why? Because Joseph needed to go to Egypt. My point is that God had, had already told Abraham 
that his descendants were going to wind up in Egypt and that they were going to be there for 400 years and that after 400 years, he was going to lead them out. Who was the person? Who was the link between Israel and Egypt? That link, his name was Joseph. So God used Joseph to get Abraham's descendants into Egypt. And then later there came a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph. And then later they became slaves. And then later, 400 years later, here's my point. You know, 400 years later, God used Moses. So you got God speaking. Yeah, you think that things are happening? God is sovereign. These are these are things that God established in his heart from the foundations of the world. In Genesis chapter 37, Joseph's brothers betrayed him. Yeah, but God had already told Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 that this thing was going to happen. And it was so, so Joseph was destined to go into Egypt. And 400 years later, Moses was destined to get him out. Joseph was the key to getting them into Egypt. Moses was the key to getting them out of Egypt. And God said this to Abraham way before it happened. So listen, God is always moving. In the case of Jesus, here you have Jesus. We're looking at Jesus. We're looking at Jesus and Pilate. Pilate's like, oh, I need to get him out of that situation. Uh, uh, let me try to find a way. And then his plan failed. You know why? He needed to go to the cross. He was supposed to go to the cross. Come on now. Now I feel like preaching. I'm going to try to keep teaching. And listen, in the case of Jesus, think about Isaiah. God takes Isaiah. Oh, my God. God takes Isaiah 700 years before Jesus and translates Isaiah 700 years forward. And Isaiah is at the foot of the cross. God revealed to Isaiah what was going to happen with Jesus 700 years before it happened. And it was so real to Isaiah that he wrote, watch this, this is God is so awesome. Isaiah wrote 700 years before it happened. He wrote what happened in past tense. Let me say that again. Let me slow it down for the people in the back. 700 years before it happened, Isaiah documented it in past tense. He's writing 700 years before it happened, and he said this in Isaiah 53 and 5. But Jesus was, he was, past tense, wounded for our transgressions. He was, past tense, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was, past tense, upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. He's writing in past tense before it happens 700 years. Here's my point. When Reuben wanted to save Joseph, and get him out of it, his plan failed. Why? Because Joseph was supposed to go to Egypt. When Pilate was trying to get G Jesus out of that situation, it, yeah, his plan failed. Why? Because Jesus was supposed to go to the cross. He was supposed to go there. What God has for you is for you. There's some things that you can't get out of. You know why? Because you're supposed to go through it. There's some things that you, that you can't get out of because it's part of your story. It is part of what God will use to develop you into the man, the woman that God has called you to be. You have to be processed to the point where you can carry the weight of the anointing of soul associated with your assignment. So listen, God sometimes will keep you from it. Hallelujah. But other times God will keep you in it. Let me say that again. There are times where God will keep you from it, but there are times where God will keep you in it. God will say, no, I'm not going to keep you from it. You, you say, God, give me less challenge. He says, instead of giving you less challenge, I'll give you more grace. Oh, my grace is sufficient. I'm not going to take you out of it, but I'm going to bless you right in the middle of it. I'm going to let you go through the fire and you're going to come out the other side and not even smell like smoke. Listen, think about it. Think about the situations in your life where you try to get out of it. And, and, and no matter how hard you try to get out of it, you still had to go through it. People try to help you. And no matter how many people try to help you to get you out of it, you still had to go through it. Why? Because you needed to go through it in order to become the man, the woman that God has called you to be. Looking back, you're like, thank you, Jesus. I endured that. That's why David said, I'm glad that I was afflicted. Had I not been afflicted, I wouldn't know God like I know God. Listen, there, there are people that are going to try to help you to not go through it, but their plans will fail because what God has for you is for you. Now that applies to blessings. When you say what God has for me is for me. Most of the time, people just apply that to the good stuff. So, but that applies to the blessing. What God has for me is for me applies to the blessing. It also applies to the stuff that's preparing you for the blessing. At the end of the day, don't run from it. Look at me. Do not run from the challenges. God is grace. You have the grace for it. You can do it. Sometimes God needs you to go right through it, knowing that his grace is on you to succeed. God will use, listen, God is so big a God. I'm talking about, he said this to Abraham before it happened. Here you got Moses and, and Joshua working out something that God had said to Abraham 400 years before it even happened. Listen, God, there's some things that God is doing in my life that he told my grandmother about. 
And so, so it's not about me. I mean, like, and so even when there's plots and plans and schemes and attacks of the enemy, God can use that thing, those things and turn them around for your good. If it looks like, watch this, no curse, no hex, no vex, no spell, no, no work of sorcery or witchcraft has any power over you. But if it looks like the, the plots and the plans of the enemy are working, remember, if it looks like it's working, then it's not against you. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. So if it's prospering, it's not against you. It's helping you. It might be pushing you, propelling you, right? into your destiny. Say what God has for me is for me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I told you I'm going to try to contain myself. I want to teach this. This is really important. Number two, when God is working in your life, uh, no, you need to know that God is working in your life even when it doesn't look like he's working. And so, so when you look at the life of Joseph, you know I love me some Joseph, some Paul, some David, some Gideon. You know, these are people I talk about all the time, but they're just good reference points. When you look at the life of Joseph, and you think of all the hell that he went through, right? With his brothers and in Potiphar's house and Potiphar's wife and the prison and all of that. Then from the outside looking in, you could think that, whoa, man, he had done something wrong or his life was all jacked up. No, he was right where he was supposed to be. God was working even when it didn't look like God was working. Every stage of the way, God was preparing him for his destiny. When you look at the life of David and you th you think of all the things that he went through with Saul and on the run and living in caves and living as a, as a fugitive, even he had to join the, the armies of his enemies. I mean, think about how crazy that was. He had to go live with the enemy. And when he was living with the enemy, you know that, that one time where he went out and he went to go fight and the enemy was like, man, we don't even trust this dude. Yeah, send him back. He went back to Ziklag. And when they got there, he had lost everything, lost everyone. And then they were there. And then his men turned on him. And at his lowest point, he cried till he ran out of tears. He cried till he ran out of tears. My God, his men wanted to kill him. He had to encourage himself in the Lord, his God. But God was working even when it didn't look like God was working. When you think of Elijah, here you have a man that stood. Elijah's a man. He stands before the king. He says, Mr. King, let me holler at your boy for a minute. What's up? God says, watch this. It's not going to rain till I say it rains. He walked away like he was big, bad, and bold, and it didn't rain for 42 months. And then after 42 months, he comes back and he says, now let me, let me announce that the rain is coming. And then he has a showdown on Mount Carmel and it's one against 450. It's Elijah on one side, 450 prophets of Baal on the other side. He said, let's call for fire. Whatever God answers by fire, let that guy be God. You guys go first. And he's mocking them. He's laughing at them. Maybe your God is sleeping. Maybe you need to yell louder. Maybe, you know, so, so then he calls down for fire. Boom, the fire comes. The 450 prophets of Baal are killed. This is the Elijah we think about. But listen, just a few days later, Elijah was depressed. Elijah was on the run. Elijah was afraid of Jezebel. And Elijah wanted to take his own life. Elijah was, was dealing with thoughts of suicide. We don't want to think about that, Elijah. But through it all, God was still God. God loved Elijah so much that God shielded and protected Elijah. And eventually he didn't even die. God took him to heaven on the chariot. I'm talking about, that's the stuff God was working, even when it doesn't look like God is working. When you think of the life of Paul, people think of the man, Paul. Yes, Paul wrote half the New Testament. Paul, yes, he went on four missionary journeys. Paul, yes, he was a pastor of pastors. But you know what they don't think about? They don't think about the Paul that was raised as Saul of Tarsus. They don't think about the Saul, the Paul that when he was converted, he tried to preach, people tried to kill him. Then he went to the, the, the disciples and he tried to preach again and they tried to kill him again. And they had to let him down the wall by a basket and he had to go live in isolation and exile for three years, learning to hear from God. He had to go through all of this stuff. Matter of fact, he went through so much stuff that by his own testimony, Paul said, I have worked much harder than all the other apostles. I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea like a movie. I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from my countrymen, danger from the Gentiles. I've been danger, in, in danger in the city. I've been in danger in the, sea, in the, in the country. I've been in danger in the, in the sea. And, and from false brothers, I've labored and I've toiled and I've gone without sleep. I know what it's like to be hungry. I know what it's like to be thirsty. I've gone without food. I've been cold. I've been naked. One time I even got bit by a poisonous snake. I've been through all of this stuff. But you know what? God was still God. God was with him every step of the way. My point here is that God is always with you. Look at me. God is always 
with you. Things may not work out the way you want them to work out. Things are not always going to be easy. Things are not always going to be peachy. I'm not going to sit here and say, oh yeah, yeah, no. Hey, I claim a Rolls Royce. People that, you know, give me this Rolls Royce. Give me this Bentley. Give me, listen, I don't know. This is ridiculous. Like, 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 if God wants you to have cars, if you like cars, God can give you 10 cars. That's not the issue. But you got to get your perspective right. You are walking with God. You need to become the man, the woman that God has called you to be. And, and, and there will be moments where, where you go through that, where it's like amazing. And there will be moments where you're like, where is God? But God is still there. God was still there with Joseph in the prison. God was still there with David in the cave. God was still there with Paul in the prison. God was still there with Jesus when Pilate turned on him. God is still there with you. I want you to find peace in knowing that God is always there. Say amen to that. All right, number three, and finally, the last one, last point for today, and I'm gonna let you go. And I'm trying to contain myself because I could preach this thing, but I really wanna teach it. Number three, your confidence must be in God and not in man. In one moment, your confidence must be in God and not in man. In one moment, Paul was, I mean, Pilate was ready to let Jesus go. And in the next moment, <laughs> Pilate buckled under the pressure of the Israelites and he ushered Jesus into his death. My, my point here is that your confidence has to be in God and not a man. Let me use Joseph as an example one more time. This is something that's personal to me. This happened, to, what happened to Joseph has happened to me on multiple occasions where I put my confidence in men. When Joseph was in prison, there was a moment where God used Joseph to interpret dreams. He, interpret, he interpreted the dreams of the butler and the baker. These were men that worked directly for Pharaoh, the king. And when the butler and the baker left the prison on their way back to Pharaoh, Joseph had already told them he knew what was going to happen. The butler was going to get his job back and the baker was going to be killed. God revealed that to Joseph. He gave him the interpretation of the dreams and he explained that to the butler and the baker. And as they went back to the Pharaoh, it happened just like he said. You know, one got his job back and one was killed. However, God didn't say anything to Joseph about the butler being his key to getting out of prison, but somehow he knew it. He just knew it. He knew in his heart that, man, this man, the butler, is the key to me getting out of prison. And so he says to the butler, and this is why you got to be careful not to put your confidence in man. He says to the butler, as the butler's leaving, hey, the butler and the baker, you guys are leaving. Mr. Baker, sorry, but when you get back there, you're going to be killed. Mr. Butler, hey, man, you're going to get your job back. He says, when you get your job back, when you go stand before the Pharaoh, please don't forget about me. Tell Pharaoh about me so that I can get out of the prison. This is in the Bible. Oh my God. He says, tell Pharaoh about me so I can get out of prison. And the butler says, I got you, dude. I got you. Dap it up. You know, I got you, man. You looked out for me. I'm going to look out for you. So I can see Joseph in the prison. Let me, let me just slow down long enough for you to picture this. Joseph has been through the pit phase. He's been through the Potiphar phase. He's in the prison phase, but he knows he's called to do something. He got a dream when he was 17 years old. He knows that the dream has not come to pass yet. He just got an interpretation of dreams from the butler and the baker. He knows the baker's about to die. The butler's about to get his job back. He says to the butler, man, when you get there, you see the king, you get your job back. You good with Pharaoh again? Tell him about me so I can get out of prison. The butler says, man, I got you, dude. I got you. My man. All right, cool. So he's he's finally like, he can't contain himself. He, he gets his hopes up. He opens his heart to believe. Listen, I don't know about you, but when you're waiting on God to do something that you know that God told you, but it hasn't happened yet, and you've been waiting for years, you know what you have to do? And I, I know Joseph did this. I've done this, and I, I'm in this moment right now. You have to guard and shield your heart. You almost have to like not open up your heart fully to it, because every time you do, you get disappointed when it's, you think it's going to happen, and then it doesn't happen, and then you wind up crying and disappointed, and then you close your heart again. And so, so, so Joseph was protecting his heart because you know how, how disappointing that, that could be when you think it's going to happen and, and then it doesn't happen. But in this moment, I just saw Joseph. It's like the Holy Ghost was allowing me to see Joseph and Joseph got his hopes up. Joseph opened up his heart like all the way up. He was like, the butler, the butler's going back and the butler's going to tell the king about me. Oh, glory to God. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the butler goes back. The baker goes back and it happened just like Joseph said. The baker was killed. The butler got his job back. But, but the Bible says that when the butler got back, he forgot about Joseph. When the butler got his job back, he forgot about Joseph. Now, two years later, it did happen. He remembered and all that. But, but let me just stick with this moment. In this moment, Joseph was devastated. And there will be people like that. People will flip-flop on you. Pilate was like, oh, I'm going to let you go. Oh, no, you got to die. 
<laughs> the butler was like, man, I got you, dude. And then he forgot about it. There are going to be people like that. There are going to be people that tell you one thing and then don't do it. There are going to be people that flip-flop on you that in one moment, hey, we down like four flat tires. In another moment, yeah, whatever, and they move on. There are going to be people that, that tell you one thing in the morning and decide something else in the afternoon. And maybe it's because there's pressure on them. And maybe it's because they just decided to move on. And maybe it's because they're fickle and phony and fake. I don't know, but just remember that God is the one who's moving pieces around on the chessboard. So your confidence can't be in them and their promises. Your confidence has to be in God anyway. Say, my confidence is in God and God alone. Pilate in one moment was like, man, this is not right. I'm going to let you go. And then in the next moment, he was like, you got to die. <laughs> and that's how it is with people. Hey, you know what? Next month, we're going to promote you. And then next month comes, oh, yeah, my bad. Yeah, we ain't doing that <laughs> with no explanation. Oh, hey, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do this. You know, I'm going to be with you forever. And then, yeah, the next moment they turn around and, and, and don't. And so your confidence has to be in God and not in man. As you walk with God, I trust that you are learning these life lessons from the life of Jesus. There's so much to learn in the life of Jesus, and I trust that you're enjoying it. So listen, lift up your voice and speak this over your life. Say, Father, my heart is open to your best. I know you have great plans for my life. I know you have placed greatness in me. I live a life that is connected to your purpose. I refuse to get out ahead of you and I will not attempt to make things happen unless you're leading me to do it. So I will wait patiently and confidently on you and your timing. I will not move until you tell me to go. Now, when you tell me to go, I will walk through every door and I will say whatever you lead me to say. I will do whatever you lead me to do, knowing that your grace is on me to succeed. My confidence is in you and in you alone. You started the work in my life and you will finish it before I die. Now, along the way, I know people will let me down. I know I will be disappointed more times than I want to remember. But despite flaky and phony people, despite challenging times, I know, Father, you are working even when it doesn't look like you're working. And you are with me every step of the way. This is why I can boldly declare Greater is coming for me. I declare this by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. This is today's word, so please apply it and prosper. If you're not getting these messages, please go to todaysword.org and sign up and get the messages. Click on the big red subscribe button and put in your email address. You're going to get all my notes in your email inbox every day uh, for free. I see that uh, one of my friends uh, who is a general officer in the, in the army uh, is watching and uh, he's African-American and, and, um, and he's been mentored by someone that I've been <laughs> mentored by. And I saw in, 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 I'll just say his name because it's such an amazing story. But uh, as an example, in the life of General Vi, Dennis Vi, the only signal officer in the history of the United States Army to become a four star. Those of us that know, he only became a four star because there were attacks against him. The, uh, there were some moves that were made on the chessboard to try to eliminate the position that he had in the Pentagon. And what the devil meant for evil, God turned it around for good. He wound up getting a position at AMC. Had he not lost his position in the Pentagon, he would have never wound up in AMC. He would have never wound up a four-star. See, what the devil means for evil, God will turn it around for your good. I'm telling you, God is working, even when it doesn't look like he's working. I love you. I've told you enough for today. God loves you more. Uh, going to this day, do me a favor, two things. Leave me some comments in the chat if this message was a blessing to you. Number two, share this message right now on your social media, on your timeline, and with your friends. I love you. God loves you more. Have a blessed day. God bless you.